Kia ora koutou and welcome to tonight's Goodfellow Unit webinar on travel medicine where they focus on high altitude travel. My name is Dr Courtney White and tonight we'll hear from two speakers, Dr Jenny Visser, a GP and lead academic for travel medicine postgraduate studies and senior lecturer at University of Otago. She works part-time in travel medicine and has extensive travel experience. Our second speaker is Peter Hillary, a mountaineer who has been on numerous expeditions, including two Everest summits. He is the son of Sir Edmund Hillary, who made the first descent of Mount Everest in 1953. Peter is the chairperson of the Himalayan Trust, providing education and other services to people in the region. So I will now hand over to our first speaker, Jenny. Thank you, Jenny. Great, thank you. So thank you so much for the invitation to speak tonight. Um, I really do feel like I have a, a very severe case of imposter syndrome when um, I'm going to be followed by Peter, who has um, had vast experience at altitude. But I'm going to draw on, on my experience of, um, of practicing travel medicine for the last few decades in advising people, traveling adventure travelers, particularly those going to high altitude. And um, also I have trekked in, in Nepal and um, in parts of South America and um, Kilimanjaro as expedition doctor. So I'll draw on all of all of those things to um, hopefully flesh out this, um, this presentation. Back in 2014, the United Nations World Tourism Organization um, put together this report on, on adventure travel and at the time it was the time when when international travel was increasing by about four to five percent per annum for all travel globally but adventure travel was increasing double digits at least twice that rate and I like this quote um, within the report saying adventure tourism used to be a relatively fringe or small niche of the overall tourism sector, but today it has become very much more mainstream. And I'm sure you're all seeing that within your practices. Um, you're seeing a, a lot more people probably going on more adventurous travel, including um, trekking at altitude, but they may be going on, um, on cycle trips or kayaking trips or, or, or whatever. And it's very easy to go online and, and purchase your, your adventure trip. Putting this into the pre-travel consultation, and I've just put up here, this is what I see as the range of the potential topics that might need to be covered in a pre-travel consultation. Now, I'm not saying you should, nor, nor, nor it would be crazy to try and cover all of these things off for every traveler in a single consultation, and, and you simply can't do it. And that's why you really need to have, um, not for all travellers, but for many travellers, you may have to have more than one consultation. You need to use your interprofessional um, team. You need to use your practice nurses, GPs, pharmacists who may be able to do some of the education as well. But I've highlighted for the adventure traveller, the things in red that may need a little bit more emphasis. Very important if somebody's heading off on an adventure trip, you need to think about pre-existing medical conditions. Are there any contraindications to the trip that they're planning to undertake? What's the impact of the condition on their ability to do this trip? And what's the impact of the trip on, on their condition? And how are they going to manage their, um, any pre-existing medical conditions while they're traveling? Obviously, most adventure travel takes place in the outdoors, so there's going to be those environmental and, and other natural hazards. You, may, you will have to touch probably on some activity-specific advice. I'm going to talk about altitude tonight. Travel insurance, vital, so important for all travelers, but especially important for travelers who are um, heading off into remote environments. And the most important thing there is to discuss with your traveler, make sure that it's fit for purpose. If they're going to go trekking at altitude, they need to make sure that the travel insurance policy they've taken out actually covers um, trekking at altitude and would cover an emergency evacuation if need be. They need to think a little bit about accessing medical care. The medical kit probably needs to be a little bit more robust than it would be for other trips. And it's, I think it's important as the practitioner, the health pr practitioner, that we also introduce a little bit about just the concept of pre-trip planning and um, preparation and training. I think adventure travellers need to be a little bit more self-reliant than, um, than other travellers. 
They should have some basic survival skills and basic first aid skills. Now, if your trekker comes from a New Zealand tramping background, they probably, hopefully, have got some of those skills. But it, I find it really surprising how many people will, will the first time they're going to put on some tramping boots and put a back, pack on their back is going to be trekking in a foreign country and, and perhaps at altitude. So I think planning and preparation is really important. And I, and I, I, you know, when they come to me with their wonderful plans and I, you know, I say oh, just simple things like, so you've traveled, you've done this sort of travel before, or you've done this sort of activity here in New Zealand. Uh, so you're an experienced tramper. Do you get out and, and do much, uh, much um, day trips or, or weekend trips? So get a feel for their previous experience. And are they familiar with the activity and the, the types of things they'll be doing, the terrain? Some people just don't have much experience of, of walking on, on uneven ground even and um and I think we could do it's really important that we can do whatever we can do to encourage them to start training and try out their gear remembering that that adventure travel and and travel uh, to altitude is almost always into a very remote and um and resource poor steer environment there will be a delay in getting to medical care and it's really important that that your travelers deal with those minor problems when early on because they very quickly compound if you're just a little bit cold and then get just a little bit dehydrated and you've got just a little bit of altitude sickness all of that will on its own will, uh, things you can easily cope with but um, as they compound it could become life-threatening I was asked to go quickly through a few key travel medicine resources and um, and you'll be able to um, look at these more closely um, when you go through the, the recording if you need to. My advice to you is just have a look around at a couple of, at, at a number of websites and decide which one suits you best. So the World Health Organization has a travel health um, homepage. It used to be very good. It's not that good anymore, but this very key document, um, which is the document that lists which countries require yellow fever vaccination to enter countries is included on this list. Um, so that's my go-to place to find out the, the latest list for that. My sort of favorite travel medicine website at the moment is, is the um, one put together by NAFNAC, um, Public Health UK. Um, Travel Health Pro. It's um, it's very user friendly. It has great resources for travellers, great resources for clinicians. Links through to all sorts of guidelines and and publications. Um, and and the, the 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 I find that they sort of have a very similar risk tolerance to what I would have and what I feel most New Zealand practitioners would have. A site that I still spend, often will go to, is the USA CDC, Centers for Disease um, Prevention and Control. And they've also got great resources for travelers and for, for clinicians. And probably the most um, widely accessed um, resource is their Yellow Book. And the 2024 version has just um, been published. This is a fantastic free online travel medicine textbook. Now, the one caveat is to remember that this is written by Americans for American health professionals. And they do tend to have, um, they're a little, little bit more risk averse than I think we are um, as practitioners in New Zealand. So things are um, actually quite conservative when it comes to, exam for example, um, prescribing anti-malarials, but it's a great resource. Public Health Scotland puts together this fantastic website. Um, and it's where I go to for, for um, malaria maps. So you just find the country, click on malaria, click on the malaria map, and it gives you a great visual visualization, but also some written text about what the malaria risk is in those countries. Canada has the Committee to Advise on Tropical Medicine and Travel. And um, that puts it's a it's not a standalone travel web uh, travel health professional website as such, but they bring together their key documents and statements and some guidelines, um, travel related guidelines, which is great. And if you want to stay up to date with um, what's happening out there with disease outbreaks, infectious diseases, and things, you can sign up for this the International Society of Infectious Diseases. ProMed Mail, and there's the link there. 
and um, you can get regular updates of, of what's happening and, and go for the digest where they summarize um, recent outbreaks for you. So back to our adventure travel and environmental factors and, and I, I, again I, I, it's really important that somewhere in our education, our pre-travel um, education, if people are heading out into the natural environment, they need to understand that they could be exposed to extremes of heat and extremes of cold and both heat injury and, and cold injury. Um, you may not feel that you have a lot of experience with this, but even if you had some um, um, resources with some websites and things that you can send them to, and we're going to talk a bit about altitude illness in a moment. So I spent a season as a volunteer doctor here at the International Port of Protection Group Rescue Post, which is in the village of Machurmo in, in the Gokio Valley in the Solokumbu region. So living at four and a half thousand meters for about four months, um, and we would deal with all the, the health needs of the porters and the guides. The local villagers would villagers who were there would come and see us as well, and trekkers would see us. So to get a feel for the sorts of things we need to prepare our trekkers for, 35% um, of the consultations were respiratory. And so very important, I think, that within your, and a lot of that was upper respiratory tract infections, but a lot of it was also the cough that a lot of people will get at high altitude. So make sure people have got some throat lozenges and cough lollies and things in their medical kits and some um, simple things, maybe a decongestant as well to help with, um, with coughs and colds. About a quarter was gastrointestinal, and most of that was traveler's diarrhea, and I'll come back to that in a moment. About a quarter was altitude, and the vast majority of that was acute mountain sickness, but also some pulmonary edema and cerebral edema. Just over 10% was trauma and musculoskeletal, so um, sprains and aches and strains and, and scrapes and bruises and things. So really important, again, in that medical kit that people have got things to deal with, with blisters and preventing blisters. Um, strapping for, for ankles and knees and things and some simple pain relief um, for, for aches and pains and about 5% was poor sleep. Oh, just one slide on traveler's diarrhea because traveler's diarrhea is your constant companion in, in many of the parts of the world where people will go high altitude trekking. So it is important that we do, re that we emphasize with our travelers going to altitude the um, on prevention how to prevent getting traveler's diarrhea so um, it's important the importance of hand washing the importance of having some system to ensure sure they can disinfect their water because they're not always going to be able to get bottled or boiled water and may not want to rely on that and all the information we always give our travelers about food and beverage choices but two things we know for certain one is that we don't follow the rules. We're not good at following the rules. Travellers will break the rules. And also, we know that in some situations, there is the environment, there is such high fecal contamination in the environment, or the people who are, including the people preparing your food, not having access to be able to wash their hands properly after they've been to the toilet and things, so that they are contaminating um, the dishes that they're serving you, and also the food hasn't been kept at proper temperatures and the like. So we have to shift our man really to self-management, our emphasis to self-management. So really important that all our travellers um, to altitude have oral rehydration solution in their packet, in, in their first aid kits. Lopiramide is your friend for both its anti-secretory and anti-motility action. And azithromycin is an antibiotic for treating the diarrhea. Most diarrhea in low, lower income countries is bacterial and responds to azithromycin. Now, over the last few years, we've, we've moved away from, and we're trying to use less um, antibiotics to treat traveler's diarrhea. But I have seen people at altitude become so deconditioned by having two, three, four days of severe diarrhea that they've had to be evacuated out because they just haven't got the strength to, to carry on. So I think we need to have a relatively low threshold to um, treat traveler's diarrhea. So on to um, altitude sickness. And these are the, the parts of the world, the, those pink to almost white areas. So the Himalayas, obviously, and the Andes in South America. Don't forget that um, in Africa, the mountains, particularly Kilimanjaro, but also Mount Kenya, 
Um, and in Borneo, um, Kinabalu is, um, uh, Mount Kinabalu is, um, Kota Kinabalu is, uh, sorry, Kinabalu is the mountain, is also a relatively um, common destination for, for our travellers. So what, what altitude matters? When does it start to matter? And I suppose it, I find it easiest to say that below two and a half thousand metres, acute altitude illness is rare. It's not impossible, but it's very, very rare to occur below two and a half thousand metres. Some people use 2,800 metres as their cutoff, but in about that range. So I think anybody going to above two and a half thousand metres needs to know that they are at risk of having acute altitude illness. They need to know what to do to reduce the risk what the signs and symptoms of acute altitude illness is and what to do if they do get symptoms. But the other two things that I always emphasize with my travelers is that people do acclimatize with time, but some people are better acclimatizers than others. It's very much like motion sickness. Some people get better quickly and, and some people acclimatize and some don't. And the other thing is it's to, for, for someone who's never been to altitude before, who I'm seeing for the first time here in my clinic in, in Wellington, I can't, there's no one test I can do that will accurately predict whether or not this is a person who's going to be prone to getting altitude illness or not. So you won't know until you get there. The Wilderness Medical Society has put together these fantastic clinical um, guidelines on the prevention and treatment of acute altitude illness. It's um, open access, so you'll be able to um, Google it and, and um and find it for yourself. And they have these three risk categories. Someone's at low risk, moderate risk, or high risk of getting acute altitude illness. And I've just emphasized there that a lot of the people I see, I think, are in the moderate group. And the moderate one of the criteria for going into the group that's at moderate risk of um, acute altitude illness is having had no history of acute mountain sickness, because most of these people are first time, um, they've never been to altitude before, but they ascend to higher than 2,800 metres in a single day. And if you look at a lot of the destinations that many of our trekkers are going to, they're either flying into above 2,800 uh, 2, metres is, is what they're using in their guidelines, or they're driving up there in one day or catching a bus up in one day. So they've not had time to acclimatise, and that's the biggest risk factor for getting symptoms. So what are the syndromes we're talking about? Acute mountain sickness, high altitude cerebral edema. These are both... Um, Instances where you, um, th this is brain swelling inside um, the, the, the cranium. And the current thinking is that these are just extremes on the same physiological continuum. So mild brain swelling is acute mountain sickness and severe brain sm swelling is um, high altitude cerebral edema. And then high altitude pulmonary edema is a different pathophysiology um, fluid on the lungs. Now I'm going to, in two slides, try to summarize the pathophysiology of acute altitude illness. And you really need weeks to do this properly. And I'm no expert, but in simple terms, it's all about the oxygen. As we go up in altitude, barometric pressure drops. The mix of gases, the percentage of each gas doesn't change, but gases expand when the barometric pressure drops. So there isn't the same driving pressure to get to allow oxygen to diffuse into the tissues and get into the blood. So you can see from this graph that the inspired oxygen drops off quite rapidly. But what's important, of course, is how much, um, how well can our body cope with that? And you can see that until you're around that 2,800, 3,000 or so mark, most of us would be able to keep our oxygen saturations up above the 90% would do okay. But once you hit around that four, four and a half, five thousand, you're on that sleep, the steep part of the slope, the slippery slidey slope, and you get very rapid drop-offs in the amount of oxygen that you can um, that you can get into your body. So your body detects that you're hypoxic. So what does it do? In the early, the three things that happen really early on. You start breathing faster and deeper, your cardiac output increases, and your heart rate out, uh, heart rate increases. And that's great because all of those things mean you get more oxygen into the blood and more oxygen delivered to the vital organs. Then over 
the first few days, you get this increase in cerebral blood flow, which is great. It's more oxygen to the brain. But the downside is this is probably what's causing the headache of acute mountain sickness. And then in the lungs, you're also getting um, a, a buildup of pulmonary artery pressure, which um, is is we think the basis of um, high altitude um, pulmonary edema. And then those other things with the increasing hematocrit and increasing muscle capillary density and hemoglobin and things, that comes later, weeks to months later. So we have both, this is a hypobaric hypoxia and the adaptive response is the hypoxic ventilatory response is triggered by the um, carotid bodies increased ventilation, improved oxygenation, and hemoglobin increases over, over weeks to months and increases oxygen carrying capacity. But the maladaptive aspect is in the lungs, the, you're getting vasoconstriction as a response to the like local hypoxia. And if you get a lot of um, local vasoconstriction, you get pulmonary hypertension, you get pressure on the tissues and you get vascular leakage. In the brain, you get cere increased cerebral blood flow, which is great for increasing oxygen delivery, but also contributes to white matter edema. In the blood, you get increased viscosity, so then increasing the risk of um, deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolism. So how do you define acute mountain sickness? So in the setting of a recent ascent to high altitude, it's a headache plus one of the following, malaise, anorexia, nausea, vomiting, dizziness. So you can see that that may be very, that is very sensitive, but it has no specificity at all, does it? So a headache at altitude could be due to acute mountain sickness, but it could also be due to a whole lot of other things. And I think the important message to get across to um, our travelers to altitude is that if they're at altitude and they develop a headache, they have to assume it's acute mountain sickness but it could be something else and you should be treating those other causes. So make sure you're well hydrated and, um, and take a bit of Panadol. And if it gets better really quickly, it, it probably isn't altitude illness, um, but, but, it's, but watch for the evolving symptoms to see if it's getting worse um, and you're moving on to, to more severe forms. Trekkers will, people will say, so what can I do to prevent getting acute mountain sickness and, and haste? And they'll ask about what can I do before I get there? Is there any acclimatization I can do before I arrive? And really the only one that we know, well, there are only two things we know definitely benefits. If you can spend a night or two at around the 2,100 to 2,500 meter altitude a couple of nights there that's high enough to kickstart acclimatization but it's low enough for most people to not get any symptoms so if you can build that into your itinerary that's fantastic there's one study that showed if people had spent a few nights at a much higher altitude in the weeks before the trek that could help as well but that's not very practical for for New Zealanders um the other thing we know works really well is chem chemoprophylaxis with acetazolamide is actually kickstarting your acclimatization before you get to altitude. And then once you're on the trek, you have to practice graded or gradual ascent. So graded gradual ascent, and the, and the, the, the important point here is that your time is on your side. Just slow down. When you're exercising at altitude, just don't go at the pace you expect to do at sea level. You know, you're not in a big rush. Just slow down, take it slowly, don't overexert. Once you're above 3,000 meters, aim to sleep no more than three to 500 meters higher than the night before, and then build in an acclimatization day for every 1,000 meters gained, or if you have exceeded that maximum 500 meters gain for that day. So this is all printed in the Wilderness Medical Society guidelines. This will be way too fast. Uh, sorry, this will be way too slow. Many people could go faster than this and be fine. But for some people, it's still going to be um, too fast. But at least it's a, it's a guideline that people can um, use. What about chemoprophylaxis? So acetazolamide, dexamethasone definitely work. The other three, ibuprofen, ginkgo, and inhaled budesonide, there's conflicting evidence. So at the moment, the go-to drug for prevention of acute mountain sickness is acetazolamide. Diamox is the, the brand name. Peter Hackett, who really is one of the is the guru of, of um, high altitude medicine, um, this lovely quote here, acetazolamide is the preferred drug. 
The dose I always start with is 125 milligrams twice daily. You start at 24 hours before you have that big jump, that big jump in altitude. Traditionally, higher doses have been used, but um, recent studies seem to suggest that for most people, the 125 BD is, is adequate. And how does it work? It aids acclimatization. It's a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor. It prevents bicarbonate excretion by the kidney, which precipitates a metabolic acidosis, which stimulates respiration. So it doesn't mask symptoms. It's not going to be a guarantee. You can still get acute altitude illness, even if you're taking acetazolamide. But if you started a day or so beforehand, you're just that little bit ahead um, of where you would be otherwise. Dexamethasone we know works really well in reducing the headache of acute mountain sickness, but it doesn't do it by aiding acclimatization. It does it by reducing the cerebral blood flow. There are concerns around side effects if people have been on it for a long time, or you're going to get a withdrawal symptom, but you usually, most people would probably only be on it for a few days. But in my experience, and having given this to people with quite severe altitude, acute mountain sickness and people with cerebral edema, is it works so quickly. I mean, it's fantastic because it works really well, but people get the sense of euphoria and that they feel fantastic and it's all, it's all now okay to go on to higher altitudes. And then when the drug wears out, they're going to be in a really dreadful way. So I do sometimes prescribe it, but I prefer only to give it to very experienced um, trekkers and, and preferably under medical supervision. So what about high altitude cerebral edema, the other end of that extreme of acute mountain sickness and, and the, the hallmark is this is truncal ataxia in, on the, in the setting of having a headache, some nausea, fatigue, but then the person becomes confused, clumsy, decreasing level of consciousness and maybe even some hallucinations. Now, it's usually preceded by a period of acute mountain sickness, but I've treated one woman at altitude where she had very brief, would have only been like a half hour, less than an hour of a, of a very mild headache and very, very quickly tipped over into um, severe cerebral edema. So um, you can, can miss it. Um, so HAIP, high altitude pulmonary edema is the most common cause of death um, from altitude illness often occurs in the second night that people are at, a, at, at, at altitude. It can be very abrupt onset. And the a very important point I feel to get across to your travelers is it may occur in the absence of acute mountain sickness and haste. You don't have to have acute mountain sickness to get hape. They often do go together and they definitely feed into each other. But just because you haven't got a headache doesn't mean you can't have a high altitude pulmonary edema. And the, pro the reason I think this is so much of a, a, a killer is because the early symptoms are these re is really nonspecific. It's fatigue, it's reducing exercise tolerance, it's shortness of breath on exertion, and it's a cough. Now, anybody who's exercising at altitude is going to be experiencing those symptoms to some extent. So... Um, so, so it's hard to pick it up early, and I think this is why it gets picked up much later. By the time someone presents with a really productive cough, hemoptysis, and severe shortness of breath at, at rest, um, it's, it's really severe. Chemoprophylaxis for HAPE, all the studies have been done in people who have had HAPE in the past, what we call HAPE susceptibles. And these are the drugs that have been shown to various extent to have some benefit. Nifedipine is probably the one we've had the most experience with. But usually we would only think about giving chemoprophylaxis against HAPE for those people who have had HAPE in the past. What do we tell, what do I tell my trekkers or people like travelers I see about management? That if they think they have acute altitude illness, they should stop where they are if it's safe to do to do so, and if there's some uh, shelter, they should rest. They should wrap up. They should have something to eat and drink because it might be something else. It may not be acute um, altitude. It may not be acute mountain sickness. Take a bit of analgesia for the headache. Take an antiemetic if you're feeling got a bit of nausea and things. And if things get better really, really quickly then you're pretty close to your acclimatization line, or maybe it wasn't altitude related at all. And if where you're planning to spend that night is pretty close to where you are, then it's probably fine to carry on to that 
to, to that altitude, but then rest up well on for the rest of that day. But if the symptoms are not improving or if they're getting worse, descend, lose altitude because your oxygen is down below you. If you you may only need to drop three to five hundred meters to be able to to um, to not have any symptoms anymore. But the really really important point you have to get across to your trekkers is never 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 ascend to a higher altitude with symptoms. You're already well above your acclimatization acclimatization line, and it's only going to get worse. Now, descent can be real descent. You can carry people down the mountain or they can walk down the mountain or be helped down the mountain, but you can also simulate it. And, and this is a portable altitude chamber. Um, it was originally designed by um, a Russian scientist um, called Gamov, and, the, the, uh, and there are still Gamov, they're called Gamov bags often, or there's one of the brands is Gamov bag. And you get the person, that we, this was in the clinic and we had two medical students. So there's one medical student in the bag and the other medical student on the foot pump. And um, you, you zip them up into this bag and you pump it full of air. You raise the pressure. And in 20 minutes of pumping, we could drop this person from four and a half thousand meters down to 2,800 meters and improve their oxygenation without having to give them any, any oxygen. It's pretty claustrophobic but they come out of that feeling a whole lot better and it buys you time while you're arranging for evacuation or waiting for the weather to get better before, so you can get, down, get them down the mountain. If you've got access to medics or clinic, then other things will be used to treat oxygen, dexamethasone um, as well. But I won't go into that in any great detail, but we might be able, if you've got questions, um, you can ask about those later. Poor sleep at altitude. This is incredibly common and it's a type of sleep. It sounds just like a sleep apnea, chain soak um, breathing. And it's, it's really scary if it's happening to you. And it's very scary if you hear it through the walls, the paper thin walls or the person in the next room or, or the person you're sharing the room with. And you wake up feeling as if you're absolutely suffocating and, um, and, and, and your sleep is... Um, is fragmented and, and very poor quality. And um, acetazolamide in often a very small dose, um, just a quarter of a tablet a couple of hours before bedtime can um, help with this. And finally, to wrap up a couple, a, res a fantastic resource for your travelers. This is put together by um, Medical Expeditions and a UK company. And it's free online. It's in many different languages. Um, you can download it as a, as a PDF. And it's got this little um, chart that you can fill in your acute mountain sickness score every morning, every me evening. And it's got some guidelines about if you're scoring three or more, then really, you know, you've got to assume you've got altitude sickness and let's do something about it. So really good um, little resource. And I will finish on, on that. Um, but just pushing I, uh, the postgraduate qualifications that um, that I convene. One one of the papers is wilderness and expedition medicine, and this is up this is up us us at the top of the Bruce um, Labor Weekend last year, um, having fun in the snow. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jenny, for that overview. That was really interesting. Um, we've got a couple of questions, so I'll do uh, I'll do a couple before um, I move on to Peter and myself, and then we should have more time for questions yep. after that as well. So um, any comments on ability to kind of purchase medication when overseas, or do you generally suggest that people take um, these prophylactic yeah. things with them? Yeah, I, I always think it's better to take as much medication as you can from New Zealand. A couple of the, the main reason being poor quality medication. It's it is very easy in Kathmandu. It is very very easy to go to the local pharmacy or not even the pharmacy and purchase whatever you want over the counter. But the concern is how the the production. What's the quality control about the production of that drug? Um, some concern that it may be full, may be counterfeit, or is it? And how has it been stored? And how old is it? Now, having said that, um, if you um, if, if you run out of medication or if you need replacement medication, if you went to a large pharmacy, associate, a pharmacy would be better than the general store or, or, the, um, um, or, or, or the market. And a, a big pharmacy that may be closely associated with a hospital is likely to have better um, systems in place for making sure that, um, that it's quite high quality medication. 
but the other but the problem is that you may not be able to get everything you want to get so i i think it's always better leave with leave with what you need yeah um any comments on traveling to altitude and pregnancy ah yes yeah <laughs> so i didn't have time to go into all the contraindications and precautions um it's it's pregnant would be yeah, being pregnancy would be considered a um a precaution you'd need to think about it first of all it depends very much on the pregnancy the trimester generally for travel we always say if you're going to travel while pregnant travel in the second trimester because you've you're beyond the the high the high risk or the higher risk for miscarriage you pretty well be pretty sure you know you've got an intrauterine pregnancy not ectopic but you could still do a scan to make make sure and you're not yet so large that you're you know you can still move around and be physically capable so second trimester but it's also and I, and I know we use this term precious pregnancy and I'm sure every pregnancy is precious but but if this you know if this was a a pregnancy after many many years of IVF and you know why why would you risk it you know it's it's not that we have data that it's unsafe for pregnant people to go to altitude it's just that there's going to be that remoteness so if something were to go wrong you can you access medical care if this is a singleton uncomplicated pregnancy then there's so much we know there's so much buffer in fetal hemoglobin that the, the fetus almost certainly will not be affected by the the degree of hypoxia that you're going to that because they're already in a hypoxic environment and 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 you know that's how fetal hemoglobin works so um the but on the other hand we don't know what the safe altitude is or isn't so the american college of um uh, obstet obstetrics and gynecology have put out a good set of guidelines they're very conservative they say don't aim to not go above about 3,500 meters or whatever but I think each every you need to have a person a one-on-one -on -one conversation and talk about the risks and things and I we I went pregnant to South America and we trekked um, the Inca Trail and um, did some trekking in um, in Bolivia and it all worked out fine because I did a bit of research and I felt confident. But I'd been to altitude before. I had a good medical kit. I had an understanding about travel, um, so it's not a, it's not a contraindication. It's a precaution. Yeah. Thank you. All right, another few questions will come in, but I think we'll move on to um, a segment with Peter, and then, like, as I say, we should have some time for um, for more questions after that. So thank you again, Jenny. Um, so Peter, few few questions for you. Um, what what's the general advice that you give for people traveling to high countries, for like, for example, South America? Look, the, the advice I give to people is you've got to give it time, and I just completely, you know, my experiences. I would completely endorse everything, you know, Jenny said about this. You need to give it time. I, I've had people come along and go, look, I'm a very busy person. Um, I've got a lot of big business on. I've got an important meeting coming up on the 21st of the month. And my response to them is, this, this trip to altitude is not for you. Um, you need time. And uh, there's a lot of those numbers that Jenny was Pointing out, I mean, you're, you're talking about ascent rates of, you know, three to 500 meters a day. It's unbelievably slow. But um, my advice to people is simply that you don't really want to subject. It's not just the individual. It's a group. Mostly people are traveling in a group of 10 or 12, 15. And you don't want to subject them to some sort of uh, group natural selection where you know five of them come through and go well it wasn't a problem for me three of them had the most terrible headaches and and two of them had to be evacuated you know that's not a very successful way to go about it so actually i look at a lot of the itineraries uh going to to elevation and i slow them up and i find that it works really well i just had a, a family going up to everest base camp I added a lot of extra days around those middle elevations that Jenny was talking about, you know, doing really nice side trips. Take the time 
And in the end, they actually spent this family two nights up at Everest Base Camp. There was no illness and they had a really good time. And that's what you want, because you imagine uh, on the other flip side of that, if you had a family arrive up there, maybe the, the daughter and the, and the father had to be evacuated. I mean, the whole trip would not be successful. It'd be a stressful situation. And despite what people say, you, you can afford a few extra days to acclimatise properly. <laughs> Thank you. Um, kind of off, off the back of that, you mentioned some families and someone has asked about children travelling with parents to altitude. Maybe for either of you, have you got any, any advice around that, like what, what you've experienced, Peter, or if you've prescribed the, the Diamox Jenny um, for children? Well, certainly, yes. I mean, in fact, we've just been up there for the ever 70th anniversary, mm -hmm. and my sister had a large, uh, happy, extended family group up there, and they had 10 children. They moved up very slowly. They did give them uh, the, that small quantity of acetazolamide, and, you know, they didn't have any problems. So I think um, a slow ascent rate, um, using the, the diamox at, at that weak rate um, really makes a big difference. But the, the key is slow ascent. It really is. It can't be overstressed. And, and, yeah. and look, I've um, been on over 50 expeditions, largely to big mountains at high altitude. I've worked as a a trek leader. And so there's a lot of anecdotal experience in there. And you've just got to give people time to acclimatize at their different rates. Yeah, I absolutely agree. There's, there's no evidence that children seem to be more or, or, or any less prone to acute altitude illness. There, there is, theoretically, they might be because the tight, the tight brain fit I mean, children, as we get older, our brain shrinks. So us oldies have got a little bit more space for our brains <laughs> to swell into. And the theory is that, well, children don't. So perhaps they're at higher risk, but it's never really been proven and there haven't been really good studies. Um, the, the one the one group, I, if the, the, my, uh, my, a colleague of mine who's a, a pediatrician does a lot of travel medicine and um, and and also interest in travel medicine and he said there's no excuse though to take the pre-verbal child to altitude mm -hmm. if they can't speak to you they can't tell you they're feeling unwell mm -hmm. you're going to have to guess by other things they're not eating or they're vomiting or whatever and also you've got to think well what's the pleasure in it for them you know why are you doing this trip but for older children, once they're once they're verbal, um, and, and I think it's a, what a fantastic opportunity. When I was working, uh, when I volunteered that season, season, my husband and my son, who was then nine, came up, and he just had an amazing time because you don't see a lot of children trekking at altitude, and and he was spoilt by everybody and just loved it. But you just got to take, it, as you said, Peter, you just got to take it more slowly. And 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 make sure that the 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 the, the trip is is age specific. You know, that it is it it is. You know, you're not biting off more than you can chew for those little ease. You got to just go that much much more slowly. I'd take my kids. Fantastic. Yeah, I think it's a great thing to do. Take children up there. You know, a family adventure where yeah. you know, <laughs> mum, dad, and the kids are all out there dealing with the same sort of issues. <laughs> I do occasionally wonder though if. If young children, you know, kids run around a lot more than adults. And so that yeah. extra exercise might perhaps exacerbate yeah. Yeah. Um, the altitude issue. But look, I, I think if you've got the right itinerary, the right ascent rate, it's a wonderful thing to do. Yeah. And, and certainly yeah, acetazolamide is used in children in, um, in, in for other conditions. And, you, and I forget, I think it's five milligrams per kilogram. Look it up, uh, or I can, I can let you know, but it's definitely <laughs> safe to use in children. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Um, please know your experience um, or people that you've um, climbed with. Have you found that altitude sickness gets worse as, as people get older or more well, prone? My experience would be that you, you, you're probably getting a bit smarter about it all and you, you're learning what you need to do. And, and certainly if you're someone like me who's gone to altitude so many times, 
I wouldn't consider myself necessarily a particularly fast acclimatizer, but I do know how I acclimatize. I know what I've got to do. And that gives me an advantage over, you know, perhaps people who haven't had that experience. But look, I just anecdotally, I, I don't think I've seen any evidence of older people being um, having more issues with altitude. I think that generally they, they move a little more slowly and they're a little more careful about the process. Oh, Peter, what's your experience? And Jenny spoke about it, of the really common issue about sleeping at altitude. What, what's your experience and what, what have you found? Um, well, sleeping at altitude. Well, let me tell you, when, when you get up to very extreme elevation, I mean, I, I notice that people start to get, and I notice myself, you know, around, particularly around the 4,000 meter mark, you get that chain stoke breathing. Mm -hmm. You'll just be aware that you've stopped breathing. And then, of course, you start panting uh, uh, to uh, lift the oxygen levels again. Um, and definitely a, a small quantity of um, Diamox really does, does help with that. Some of my memories of climbing on 8,000 meter peaks, I mean, honestly, it's nightmarish. I, I remember up camps up at over seven and a half thousand meters and you're just starting to go to sleep and you've, you've been terrified by this chain stoke breathing. And then all of a sudden, you're not even completely unconscious. You're aware that you've stopped breathing again and it's this horrible sense of suffocation. <laughs> And then suddenly, you know, you, you wake up fully and, and you're just hyperventilating, trying to drag that air back, back into you again. And you lie there for a while going, why do I do this? Why do I keep climbing on big mountains and uh, <laughs> trying to understand your, your motivations for all of this? And then, of course, you start going back to sleep again and that recurs again and again. Mm -hmm. But certainly, um, yeah, a, a, a small dose of Diamox helps. Mm -hmm. And, and I think, oh, sorry, oh, sorry just, yeah, the, the other thing to realize is that you can have this disrupted sleep, even if you're well acclimatized. The thinking now is it's not, it's not a for, it's not part of the acute altitude illness. You can be well acclimatized and still, and every time I came off the Diamox, it started up again, even though I was well acclimatized. So I'd just go back and stay on it. I'm a bit of a Diamox junkie person. <laughs> Is there any place for, for sleeping tablets or, or sedatives? I'm not sure either. Peter, in your experience, well, or I mean, certainly what, what we heard in the, you know, when I first started going up to altitude is, yeah. is a lot of the, the sleeping tablets, you know, 30, 40 years ago were quite dangerous um, uh, for acclimatization and they were definitely recommended not to take them. But I, I'm inclined to think it's not a good idea, but um, that's what I've always advised people. Right. Yeah, the, the main concern, of course, is that most of the sleeping tablets will, will suppress ventilation to some degree. Oh, so that's the concern. Mm -hmm. But it's based very much on... Um, on, a, on a hypothesis rather than real evidence. And there is, again, Peter Hackett, who I mentioned before, pretty sure it was his group, did do one study, people taking low dose, I think it was Zopiclone or, or Inver, and, and they did have better, better sleep, they reported better sleep, and there was no drop off in their oxygenations through the night. So um, it, it's probably okay, it's probably safe, but we've still got that hangover, haven't we? That fear that may actually be doing more harm than good. Yeah. And um, Peter, any um, comments on um, eating when you're at high altitude or in the death zone? <laughs> well, I mean, look, you know, I, I've sort of studied that the issue of eating with altitude quite a bit, and, and I read all these papers about how our capacity to metabolize food goes down as we go up. You, you do suffer a, a type of anorexia with, with, with altitude. And then, you know, added into this, you're not actually benefiting from the food. We also find that complex foods are not metabolized very well. So you really do have to eat simple foods. So um, typically on high altitude expeditions, you're really, the best food is, the, the classic food of Nepal, dal bat, you know, boiled rice and, and lentils. Um, cook it in a pressure cooker in 11 minutes, it's ready to go. Um, but very, very simple food. But typically, 
as you get higher on very high mountains, you're really not eating substantially at all. I remember the last time I climbed Everest, um, the only food I had the previous evening before we started climbing was half a bag of instant mashed potato. And that's really all I wanted. And, and I think for the nutrition you get out of it, it's not something to worry about. The big thing is hydration, hydration, um, the right sort of electrolytes, um, up there, because we are, you know, virtually hyperventilating all the time be because of the rarefied atmosphere, the pressure at 8,000 meters and above is less than a third of an atmosphere. So you are losing a lot of moisture just from your the very deep and rapid breathing. Um, and so hydration is extremely important. And it's a very hard thing to do. Quite often, we'll be up in a tent and, you know, I mean, Courtney, it'd be your turn. You've got the stove going, you're melting snow and ice, making up the electrolyte drink or the sweet drinks or whatever it is. And then you wake me up and we drink these, these drinks. And then it's my turn to run the stove um, because it just takes, you, you need liters and liters and it takes a long time to rehydrate when you've been out there climbing at very extreme elevation. So is there a bit of a, quite a tight balance then between trying to get up there before you get too dehydrated or mal malnourished kind of thing versus not wanting to give yourself too much altitude sickness? Yeah, I mean, it really is. A, a, a timing comes into this in a very big way. And that's why climbers on very high mountains, they're waiting for that window in the weather and they drop back down to an elevation where their acclimatization is strong, typically around the base camp level. And base camps on a lot of these big Himalayan peaks are around the 5,000 meter mark, so they are very high. But we do acclimatize very well to that elevation once you've put the time in. And you can really enjoy your food. Um, but quite often during an expedition, if the weather's bad, we will drop back down again, maybe to 4,000 meters where you're incredibly well acclimatized. And it's it's phenomenal experience um, because you get down there 4,000 meters and you're a you know, high altitude machine at that point. You sleep like a log, your appetite is just raging. You, so you're really enjoying your food and you do put condition back on, which is what you need because People lose a lot of weight up there on high altitude expeditions. We had fat calipers and scales on one expedition and everyone was losing weight rapidly. Fat percentages were going down and then the fat percentages were single digit and they were no longer going down, but the weight kept going down. So, you know, we're obviously, um, you know, using our, um, our muscle tissue and, and really at that point, it's probably over. It's probably time to go home. Any any other comments or um, advice you give for patients in terms of staying hydrated or, or as well fed as you can be? <laughs> yeah, I, I think for the, yeah for, the, for most. Oh, sorry, but for most of the, the trekkers that I see, they're going maybe four and a half sleep and maybe go over some five and a half thousand meter passes and down. So it's not as big an issue. Although the hydration can still be an issue um because you are breathing deeper and faster you're losing a little bit more but but there's also it's gotten to the the, the popular um, vernacular and, and that you have to you have to drink liters and liters and liters and, and actually i think we're now at risk for some some of those the lower altitude trekkers of actually over hydrating and and actually all you end up doing is peeing a lot more than you need to and 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 there is this concept within now within in sports medicine and, and other brands is, is that we, we're going back to drinking to thirst. You know, this whole thing about, you know, you've got to drink so many liters a day and, and by the time you're thirsty, you're 5% dehydrated actually isn't, isn't, isn't that well founded. Very, very different, of course, for, for Peter and, you know, when you're at very high, um, very high mountaineering, but for your average trekker, I think just drinking to thirst and maybe just adding an extra liter or so through the day is, is, is going to be plenty. I have a lot of memories of, of taking groups across the Tibetan plateau. And of course, some people do take this hydration business to great heights. <laughs> 
and we'd be going across the plateau and we, we would organize for a, a little toilet tent to be put up on, on the side of the road every so often. And the ones who'd taken on board a, a very high hydration mm -hmm. scheme, mm -hmm. you'd see the vehicles pulling up over to the side of the road the door bursting open and these people would be sprinting from the vehicle to the toilet tent. Um, whereas, you know, others of us, we needed to go, but it wasn't quite yeah. that urgent. But no, that that seems, Jenny, to make so much sense to me, you know, drink to the thirst, drink to what you really feel you feel need. You need. Yeah. And probably a question for both of you, really. Um, are there any specific electrolytes or kind of composition that people need to be aware of when they're at altitude for example like are they at risk of sodium well, exactly. loss we've, when we've been in remote areas we've we've often you know you, we may have some electrolyte but then you mm. if you really are thirsty you you have to make something up yourself so it was sort of a pinch of salt with a bit of sugar or yeah. maybe you're chewing on a a biscuit or something to <laughs> add a little bit of uh, sort of glucose and whatever to it and, and that actually seemed to work quite well oh, too yeah. but obviously good electrolytes make a difference yeah, uh, yeah if, if, if you're eating well and you've got a reasonably well balanced diet I mean you're getting plenty of salt and you know that, that you need in, in 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 your food and then just water and cups of tea and things are fine um I think when you need definite need electrolytes, as I said, if you've got diarrhea and you're not eating, so with with if you've got a bout of diarrhea, or if you're exercising really really heavily and you're not um, eating much in the way of solid food, then yes, you need electrolytes. So and yeah, the the the, the self made electrolyte solution is for a liter of water, six teaspoons of sugar, and a teaspoon of salt. Mm -hmm. And it tastes awful. So then you can, if you if you've got a, no, you wouldn't have lemon, but anything you could add a bit of flavouring to it if, if you wanted to. Yeah. You know, interestingly enough, I think a, a lot of those uh, dehydrated meals we're getting so conscious about not having mm. so much salt. Um, when I was skiing to the South Pole. Um, we realized that they didn't have that much salt in they them. Didn't. We were working incredibly yeah. hard hauling these enormous 200 kilogram mm -hmm. sleds. Mm -hmm. And we realized we just didn't have enough salt. And, um, you know, it actually was, was difficult because we had what we had. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it, when you're typically trekking in the Himalayas, it's never a problem. I don't think it's a problem. No. Add, add to your diet. Interesting. Um, Probably another question for both of you, really. Any advice around managing major or minor injuries um, when climbing? Well, trying to avoid them in the first place. <laughs> one of the most important things in alpinism in particular, because you're, you're by definition, you're going to be in remote areas and often quite extreme areas. Um, but if something happens, you, you're going to have to deal with it yourselves. And, and mm. that's... Um, one of the big challenges on, on alpine expeditions, you know, helping someone who's perhaps cut themselves badly, mm. you know, getting them back down the mountain and having to do it in a timely fashion. And if we use the word timely, but when these things happen, nothing's timely and it takes longer and longer. Mm. And uh, Yeah, and I think that comes back to that where I say sort of preparation and planning is is thinking about what are the types of injuries that might occur? What can what can this person as a lay person manage? And, and I think doing a basic first aid course, if, if you haven't, if you've never done one, I, you know, there's no harm in, in, in that. If you do have a medic, or if you are going as the expedition doctor or, or medic, then then that's a whole other question, isn't it? Because there's, you know, where, how much do you carry and who's going to carry it and what budget do you have and um, and what can you get across the border and things. But then you've got a whole lot more that, that you can do. But I think the other aspect is also is, is prevention. It's simple things like... Um, make sure you're breaking your boots before you go trekking at altitude you know you don't want to get a blister there get the blister while you're here at sea level and and you can deal with it because it, it i i know that your experience peter but i think i think wounds and things do heal a lot more slowly at altitude and i'm sure it's because of the the lack of oxygen and and other physiological stress so 
you know, and so try out, you get, you know, make sure your clothing's comfortable. You're not going to be chafing or, or, or anything. So it's, it's trying out all your gear before you go helps as well. Yeah. Thank you, Jenny. Um, yes, yeah, so you mentioned some practical things for people to do. Peter, someone's asked, apart from physical fitness, how do you mentally prepare for such big climbs? Look, I think you've got to do a lot of it. And the, the way to work your way, I mean, I often say you need to do your apprenticeship. I mean, we read in the media all the time because the media love to find these people, the ones who turn up at a big mountain like Mount Everest with no experience thinking they'll just sort of pay someone to help them get up and they'll work it out as they go. Well, obviously, that is a complete folly. Um, you know, if you wanted to, someone comes to me and goes, I'd love to climb Mount Everest, I'd say, put a 10 year plan together, you know, go rock climbing, you know, go and learn how to use ropes, trust in your 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 techniques for for rock climbing. Go and do some ice climbing, do some snow caving up on Mount Ruapehu, go down to the Southern Alps, you know, another summer and climb a couple of peaks in the Mount Cook area. Build your experiences up. Um, go to the European Alps, you know, go to the Himalayas and do some smaller peaks, learn about altitude. And then eventually, after that five to 10 years of building experiences, learning to trust the other members of the group, then, you know, go, look, I'm ready to go and attempt an 8,000 meter peak, one of the really big ones. But you, by then you understand altitude, you understand yourself, um, you've got the techniques, um, you've got experience. And people sometimes go, well, I hear though that the standard route on Mount Everest, for example, is not super technical. It's not super technical to an extent. It has huge exposures. Um, for example, when you're on the knife edge summit ridge of Everest, it does drop 3,000 meters on the left side and 4,500 meters on the right side, which, as I said to King Charles when I was in, uh, in London a couple of weeks ago, it's kind of academic whether you fall 10 meters or 3,000 meters, the, the result is the same. It's very, very negative. Um, but look, it's, it's having the technical expertise so that you do move up on the mountain in an efficient and confident manner. And if you, you don't have experience and you don't have the techniques, then you're going to use more energy and you're going to feel more vulnerable. So it's just stacking um the, the the risk factors off in your direction so that you really have an advantage um, because you're well prepared interesting thank you <laughs> got a bit nervous thinking about those drops and um, yes, well, right. Right. <laughs> they're, they're big drops <laughs> all right um i'll just um direct the question to Jenny because we've had a couple of questions come through about sleep apnea um, and going to altitude is that a complete contraindication they just need to be careful where they are oh, how long they go without CPAP yeah yeah if somebody has a history of sleep apnea yeah we we, yeah, we don't really know I mean the 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 sleep the the change stoke that people do experience is so much like sleep apnea, but we, but, but is it a separate condition to people who've got sleep apnea at sea level? We wouldn't say it's an absolute contraindication, but I would certainly recommend that people go to some intermediary altitudes first and, and, and try it out. The problem is your CPAP, if you, if you're reliant on CPAP, you probably shouldn't because how are you going to run your machine as well? Although you can now get little portable ones, apparently. Um, so I look, I'd, it, it would be you'd want to think long and hard about it yeah yeah and probably a question for both of you um any comments on oh we might have talked about age already and going up to altitude yep. <laughs> and is there yeah, like a cutoff Pretty or yeah just very and person dependent absolutely and, and yeah I, I wouldn't i'd hesitate put an age on it because you know some some 70 year olds are physiologically younger than some 50 year olds aren't they so i <laughs> if you've got the skills go 
any comments from you, Peter, in terms of... Oh, look, if you've got the motivation, <laughs> go. I mean, life is for living, and within reason, I, I think if, if you have a desire to go and do that, you do your right preparations, get yourself fit, make sure the shoes fit so you don't get blisters, I think you should go and have the adventure mm. of your life. Oh, any comments, Peter, on being uh, the dangers of being in a tent in the, in the death zone or very, very high up? Well, actually, uh, that is an area that has always really worried me because if you get caught in a storm in a tent or a snow cave up in the death zone at 8,000 metres, um, it, that's a really serious situation. And I have been caught in difficult weather conditions. And the reason is, is that the longer you stay there, the higher the chances are that you will develop, you know, cerebral edema or pulmonary edema. Um, you know, so th that that is a concern. So you really need to think about what the weather conditions are doing. Um, when you go up there, it's not just a case of getting up to that large staging post, making your climb of the mountain and getting back to that high camp. Um, the, the lower you can get down, the better. So you always want to make sure that there is time to descend the mountain so that you're not going to get stuck there. In fact, every time I've climbed Everest, I've actually descended all the way back down to the advanced base. Um, in the Western Coombe, and it had that absolutely marvellous effect. You're absolutely shattered from these 18, 19-hour days, and you're dehydrated. But when you get there, you know, you sleep well, you eat well, and the next day you're feeling a lot better. So it's worth trying to make sure that you have the conditions that you don't get stuck in a high camp. Right. Thank you. Um... <clears throat> A couple of quite medical questions for Jenny. We've had quite a few questions come through in terms of pre-existing conditions, what might or might not be okay at altitude. And it might be a case of that's when we refer them to you. Um, yeah. We've yes. had things yeah. like um, high blood pressure, previous DVT, yes. previous pulmonary edema. Any any comments? Any or is it just so, <laughs> yeah, so a, certainly a, a, a contraindication with any if you have pre-existing pulmonary hypertension, because the pathophysiology of high altitude pulmonary edema is really about pulmonary hypertension and, and vascular leak. So you'd that would you'd you'd be very wary about a person going um, to altitude with with that. Obviously, severe COPD and if you're on oxygen at sea level, you, you would be silly. To, I mean, you're not. You know, so, but the the difficulty will be maybe people with mild COPD, and you don't know how much they're going to decompensate at, at altitude. I would discuss that with their respiratory physician. Um, you can do um, hypoxic challenge tests to see how far people are going to desaturate at different um, levels of hypoxia, although it yeah, may not be entirely transferable into the field but you'd be a bit weary hypertension as long as it's well I think all pre-existing medical conditions the most important thing is that you get them under as good a control as you can at sea level so if people are well controlled here that's the baseline if they're not well controlled at home at sea level then they shouldn't be going to altitude we do know with hypertension with that sympathetic you get that sympathetic outpouring in the in the first few days quite a few people their blood pressure does go it's quite variable it goes up and down but um the the general advice is if your hypertension is well controlled at sea level it's fine ischemic heart disease if you're cleared for normal exercise at sea level then you should be fine to go to altitude or if it's been managed and treated but again i would discuss that with the cardiologist as well obviously someone with ongoing angina shouldn't be going to altitude um, there is a really good paper, and I, I should have put it in the um, a relatively recent summary by a colleague, um, Jared Flaherty, on um, travel to altitude with pre-existing medical conditions, and it's a really good um, um, sum summary. I can send it to you and you might be able to put it up on the website or something, Courtney. Yes, we can. Yeah, um, we can make yeah. Resources yeah. Resources. Oh, and, and sorry, and the other contraindication is sickle cell disease, which is not a big issue in New Zealand, but um, but even with people with sickle cell tray may um, may have problems at altitude as well. Yeah. 
right, we might have time for one or two more questions, I think. Um, from either of you, really, Peter, you might have some experience with this or Jenny, one of some advice to, for us to give patients. But if people think they're getting frostbite, I think Jenny mentioned frost nip in your presentation. Any advice or experience um, with that? Peter, have you you go ahead? Well, I've, I haven't had frostbite, but I've had frost nip. nip and you've yeah. got to keep wiggling, wiggling your toes. I, my big <laughs> right toe is a little um, the nerve damage from frost nip on, on a Mount Everest expedition. Mm. Um, but, you know, that's where a lot of discipline comes into it. Mm. And there's some fascinating stories of climbers who've been caught out very high on very big peaks, very cold conditions, and where you, you really have a, quite an overwhelming desire just to curl up in a ball on a little ledge in the snow and go to sleep. Of course, that's probably going to be the end. And if it's not the end, it's going to be severe frostbite. So you simply have to be disciplined. And these climbers have, they've, they've said they've just danced. They've just kept moving, wriggling their toes, moving their fingers inside their mittens, keeping the body going, and they just go for hours and hours and hours until they feel the lights coming up again and they're in a position to get themselves off the mountain. So you really need to avoid frostbite, that's mm -hmm. for sure, and I've, I've certainly seen a number of people with it uh, with various degrees and a, a very serious condition if you get it. But it is all about prevention, as if you can prevention isn't it so again it's gear it's having the appropriate gear it's it, and it's trying to keep um peripheries warm once once something is is frozen and i've never had to deal with it but the um, wilderness medical society have also put out very good guidelines on the management of um cold injury and and frostbite and the and the general consensus is that um you you if you if you have a frozen limb keep it frozen there's nothing worse than thawing and then refreezing a refreezing injury will do way more damage so if if somebody um and also once you have thawed out a frozen leg people or foot or toes or whatever people can't wait there anymore so you've now turned that person into someone who could self-evacuate out on a frozen limb is now someone who's going to have to be carried out so if you but if you're in a situation controlled situation then there is this rapid rewarming the current um there the current um consensus is rapid rewarming with water of like a a a, 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 a hot but not you know, a hot bath and you defrost the limb as best you can but you need to give them pain relief and ideally um ibuprofen or one of the other anti-inflammatories because you want the antiprostaglandins um, as, as well um, and then you protect it and evacuate them out but it's all about prevention isn't it and, and I know I've spoken to to colleagues who have uh, medical colleagues who have defrosted limbs at Everest base camp but then they know they can evacuate people out yeah um, I'm going to a specific question for Jenny here. Um, if people have a sulfur allergy, um, what would you give them instead of acetazolamide? Well, the, the whole, I know, yeah. So I would still give, unless they had an anaphylaxis. I mean, first of all, people say they had a sulfur allergy. Well, what did they have a sulfur allergy to? It was usually a sulfur antibiotic. And if it was an allergy, what was the reaction? Was it an anaphylaxis or was it a rash or was it a whatever? Um, but there is a really good paper that has come out, and I should try and find it and put it in the chat box, which actually shows that there isn't any correlation between an allergy to a sulfur-based antibiotics and an allergy to other sulfur-based drugs. In fact, if you have an allergy to a sulfur-based antibiotic, you are far more likely to be allergic to penicillin than you are to acetazolamide. So the thinking is actually, even though it's a sulfur drug, most people, their sulfur allergy is an allergy to sulfur antibiotics. So, but you would naturally be a little bit hesitant. So those people, and often with acetazolamide, I get people to do a trial at sea level anyway, 
because the paresthesia that some people get can be really off-putting. If that's the first time you experience it is when you're at altitude and you think, oh God, is this, am I having a stroke or something? You know, what, what's happening here? So um, just taking it for a couple of days, um, at, you know, before you go. And then if you do have some reaction, at least it's in a controlled environment and you'll be fine. But I, I it's... But a sulfur allergy to, a, or a minor moderate allergy to a sulfur antibiotic is not considered a contraindication to acetazolamide. Yeah. And might be one for Jenny again, unless Peter's got any vacancies. We've got some people quite keen to get into expedition medicine. <laughs> any tips? <laughs> yeah, look, it's, um, I know, I know, it, it, it's, it's difficult in New Zealand to make a career out of being expedition doctor because there's just not enough business but it, but there are doctors overseas who do um i mean i've i've done um so it's in, so nine summers now in antarctica and the stint in nepal and i've been expedition medic for a um a couple of um groups with it through a group called inspired adventures and i've been film crew doctor and and actually all of these were just opportunities that presented themselves you know someone said hey we need a doctor to do this and i thought and i would think oh gosh i can't possibly do it because it's going to be inconvenient because i've got a full-time general practice and i've got a three-year-old child and a whatever but you've just got to seize the opportunity and do it because then when you do it once you may get invited back to do it do it again um, I think being a generalist makes you a, is a great skill for expedition doctors. So I think GPs are well placed to to be good expedition doctors. Um, and ED physicians or ED, you know, got some ED training as well would be would be fantastic. There are quite a few websites around there now. I think there's called one called Adventure Medics or whatever, you know, and where they advertise the jobs and things, and and you can you can give it a go. Um, yeah, yeah. I don't know if I've really answered the question, but <laughs> it's, if the if the opportunity arises, take it. Peter, do you have a do you have room for medics on your expeditions? Well, we we have had um, doc doctors on quite a few of the bigger bigger expeditions, and they've been really important parts of the team. Mm -hmm. Generally, a climbing member, but also with you know obviously additional mm -hmm. medical um, responsibilities, but. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's a wonderful thing to do. And as as you've done, you know, it opens up possibilities such as being on ships down mm. to Antarctica because all the ships going to Antarctica have Thank doctors you. on board. Yeah. And um, there are lots of expeditions. And as those early figures show, the interest in adventure travel just keeps going up. So there is a, a big demand for, for doctors in those areas mm. as well. Yeah, and come come and do my postgraduate paper. <laughs> All right, I think we'll wrap it up there for tonight. Um, so thank you again so much to our two speakers uh, for your time tonight, uh, Jenny for your medical expertise um, and Peter for your vast experience. Um, to our audience, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you and have a lovely rest of your night, everyone.